<clears throat> yeah, so I'll just get started with the announcements. Um, I wanted to thank you all very much for coming this evening um, to our brown bag Zoom series, because I don't know what else to call it, um, <laughs> during these unusual times of the coronavirus. And we look forward to the day that we'll be able to get back and seeing everyone in person, because that is, uh, yeah, we like to be all together. So um, uh, I wanted to invite you to go to our website if you haven't seen it. We have a kind of a new and improved snazzy website that um, we got some really wonderful. Okay, you made it, Gloria, I see you. Um, she's here, Jody. Um, and um, so I would like you to invite you to go to our website. If you haven't seen it, we, have, um, we also have a Facebook page. A new feature on our website is that you can pay your membership online. It's PayPal and credit card. It's kind of a nice handy little thing that we, uh, we have on there now. Um, and also our, our membership, the membership uh, um, goes toward um, a, our scholarships. We hand out four scholarships a year. We're hoping to also um, expand that maybe. Um, so we, uh, we look forward to seeing how that goes this year. It's going to be a little different, we know. Also, with your membership, um, we have a new addition. We are having an all-together Williamsburg social hour. Um, those are, it's for members only. October 26th from 3 to 4 is our next one. And um, we, have, we get together and, and talk about whatever is on your mind for, for the, the month. And uh, so we look forward to, to you joining us there too. Those, that link will come to you in an email. And um, so, yeah, please take a look at our website and our Facebook page. Um, also, I wanted to share with you two items that, um, uh, well, first, we are our last weekend for our Black Lives Matter lemonade stand is this weekend. Um, this is our fourth year of doing it. Uh, so we're looking forward to our um, fifth year next year, starting the season. If you want to get get uh, signed up to to uh, participate in the the uh, we socially distance and wear a mask, um, but many of you have been there and sat with us as we've engaged with the community on why Black Lives Matter. It's a wonderful way to um, learn about what our community has to say, um, and. Uh, uh, see here. So come and join us on Saturday for our last one for the for the season. And there's a farmer's market going on there. It's from 10 to 12. Um, and also, so I got uh, a email uh, from a, you might know about this, Dr. Henderson, there is going to be an event um, with the Lemon Project. Uh, yeah. It um, is going to be um, uh, the case for reparations, a lemon legacy porch talk, um, and you can go to the uh, the lemon um, the lemon project site on the William and Mary website uh, to sign up for that, and that will be October twenty seventh from seven to eight. Uh, and I think you can read him, Doc, uh, Tanahasi Coates's um, article. Uh, will be talked about so you can go to the website and, and read the article. Also uh, received information that uh, there will be a, a discussion, a free lecture from 7 to 8.30 on October 29th, um, Inside Virginia's Voter Rights Revolution, How the General Assembly Increased Access to the Ballot. Uh, Delegate Jones um, will be uh, speaking on this. Um, so you can go to also our website, have both of these uh, events listed um, so that you can link you there to, to, to join in those conversations. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping about uh, All Together. All Together is um, a community organization bridging racial, ethnic, and cultural lines. Our mission encourages and engages engaging in activities that foster unity, inclusiveness, equality opportunities through dialogue and education. Um, we, were, we were established over 20 years ago um, in the greater Williamsburg area. 
something that we are not. We are not a political action agent, advocate, action or advocacy group, and we are partisan. Oh, we are nonpartisan. So, without further ado, um, our guest tonight is Dr. Laniel Henderson. He actually uh, was our guest last month as well, but he talks uh, and knows about the election process and <laughs> all of the things that go into it. So he, uh, we've invited him to come back. He actually, he spoke to us four years ago about the election then. So we thought, well, why not have him come back and tell us where we're headed? Because somebody needs to help us with that right now. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, he's also, um, let me just say, he's an adjunct professor at the College of William and Mary. He also is, has a new title. You just told us um, during, while we were setting up, Dr. Henderson, what is your new title? Um, you, is that what you said, King? <laughs> Are you kidding? Do you see any crown, any jewels up here in the crown? You know, no, it's, uh, I had served as Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Virginia State the last year and uh, decided given COVID and the need for the college to raise money since they are, are losing like William and Mary significant revenues from athletics and falling to uh, enrollment. Uh, we are now called senior fellow and eminent scholar. And uh, so this is the fifth year of my association with William and Mary as actually a visiting professor. Uh, I try to avoid the word adjunct because uh, my sons say that uh, for me, adjunct means adding junk to the curriculum. And so they wanted a different title. Uh, but it's a privilege, really. And uh, like you, I'm trying to figure out what's going on as well. So we are all students of the election process uh, together and uh, literally all together. And on top of that, uh, you know, this is a very, very unusual set of circumstances for any election, let alone a, a presidential election. So glad to have a chance just to share a few observations about it and, and then to engage in some dialogue about it. Uh, uh, three things I just want to emphasize. One is that, as we said four years ago and maybe a month ago, it's important to keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about elections that we still, in spite of the uh, preoccupation with the actions of the president, and the federal government, we still are in a federalist system. That is to say, states and localities still matter in the country. And uh, one thing to understand about elections is that uh, while they get a lot of national uh, mass media and social media attention, uh, they really generate from the local level up rather than from the national level down. And I want to emphasize that point because um, in 2016, in addition to electing a president, vice president, uh, and a third of the Senate and all of the House of Representatives, uh, we were also electing 127,000 elected officials at the state and local level at the same time. And while we didn't give as much attention to that as we did to the national elections, it turns out that that was just as critical as anything that happened almost at the national level because uh, the fertilizer and the seeding of what happened in the midterm elections 2018 really uh, took place in those uh, lo mostly local elections of 2016 because while a large number of those local elections were nonpartisan, the orientation of most of those officials were uh, was democratic, and it paralleled and connected to the uh, the win in the popular vote for Hillary Clinton. So uh, that is connected to the blue upsurge in the midterm elections, especially the congressional elections of 2018. So we should keep that in mind because uh, as we go forward, that's going to be also critical on. November 3rd and thereafter is uh, who's on the ballot at the state level, who's on the ballot at the local level, uh, and not only what their partisan orientation is, but also what their public policy orientation is. So I want to emphasize that federalism bit, and I'll come back to that uh, 
in just uh, a minute. I think the, the second thing I want to emphasize about the elections is that you, while it is true that we are really sort of choosing at the presidential level between two elderly white men, uh, again, uh, the stakes couldn't be higher. Uh, we, we know about uh, the ravages of the coronavirus, not only on the national and, and local and household health, but also on the economic health of the country. You know, where we have seen record numbers of people go out of business. We have seen uh, record levels of unemployment and filing of unemployment uh, insurance claims. Uh, the economic dislocations are, you know, many times more than the economic dislocations we experienced in the 2007 2008 uh, financial crisis that made necessary the uh, Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2007. So, uh, you know, whoever leaves this country going forward, uh, the stakes are really large because uh, the presidency for all the, you know, uh, the, the things that we think about it is not just a person, it's an institution. And that institution is connected to the military uh, in the president's role as commander in chief uh, he is the chief public administrator because he presides over a cabinet that, uh, you know, manages about uh, three and a half to four trillion dollars of, of budget. Uh, and in the office of the president is not only the vice president, but uh, the office of management and budget, which is a huge administrative agency that uh, sets the guidelines for the way money is spent, even though Congress is con constitutionally responsible for approving appropriations and monies that uh, these bureaucracies spend. So um, this is what's at stake here is the, the entire administrative process. And so when people say things like, well, both Trump and Biden are really too old to be president, you know, uh, that may or may not be true. But the question is, who they put around them and who they listen to when, when they put, around, put those persons around them, that really is going to count because the president really is the facilitator of that vast inner circle of people that works with the president. And so the questions that we're raising are the right questions, not only who the vice presidential running mate is going to be, but what the administrative team is going to look like, because this is the team that uh, will carry forward uh, whatever the legislative agenda is going to be that the Congress passes, which next brings me to my next point, and that is the joint focus on the presidential election and the congressional elections uh, is very, very important um, to see what happens with the Senate and with the House of Representatives, whether, for example, the blue wave that we saw in uh, 2018 will be sustained and indeed may be expanded in 2020, or whether it will contract uh, back a few seats uh, on the House side. And then on the Senate side, whether the, the coattails of Joe Biden will be sufficient to help uh, Democrats who are running in close Senate races in places like Arizona um, and uh, Georgia uh, and several other states where, you know, the, and even South Carolina, where Lindsey Graham is facing a very serious challenge from a, an African-American Senate candidate who's running as a Democrat. And by the way, if that person gets elected and Lindsey Graham loses, uh, this will be really the first time since Reconstruction that we've had two black U.S. senators from the same state. Uh, in the Congress. So it would be definitely historic. One, but the difference will be the first time we did this, uh, uh, right after Reconstruction in Mississippi, uh, Hiram Revels and Blanche Clay Bruce, uh, both African Americans, were both members of the Republican Party. That's the Lincoln Republican Party. And the senators were selected by the state legislature, not by the popular vote. Uh, so the 17th Amendment changed that. So if that person wins in South Carolina and beats Lindsey Graham, 
we'll have uh, one Democrat and one Republican, both African Americans from South Carolina. That will be new, especially from a state in the South, the Deep South. So there, there's that, and then of course, uh, uh, everyone is is sure that uh, we're going to see a Democrat win in North Carolina, even with his personal scandal, and we're going to see uh, a Democrat win in Arizona, uh, beat McSally. And uh, it's quite possible that we may have two female U.S. senators from uh, Arizona. Uh, we haven't seen that since we saw two female U.S. senators from California, uh, Boxer and Feinstein, and now and then Kamala Harris and Feinstein. And, and then the question is, who's going to succeed Kamala Harris? So there's a lot going on here. And I, the, the reason I emphasize this is that if we are expecting significant forward movement in public policy, uh, we're going to have to have a less divided Congress than we've had the last four years. Uh, quite frankly, I mean, and this is just a perspective from a political scientist that has not, is really not partisan. It just happens to be the way it is. Th this Congress in the last four years has produced very little in the way of legislation. Very little. Uh, in the first two years, the only thing that they could really say they produced was that uh, you know, Tax Reform Act of 2017 in December, which ended up uh, really putting more of a tax burden on the middle class and uh, relieving the top 1% of income generators in the country. Aside from that, there's no infrastructure legislation. There's no significant shifts in health care policy in spite of all of the controversy and the criticism of Obamacare. Um, there is nothing in the way of big, um, you know, um, uh, international developments uh, at the legislative level. There are certainly many international developments at the diplomatic level. Uh, so the, we're really going to need a much more productive Congress that really it has a firmer grip on its constitutional responsibilities than the Congress we've seen the, in the last four years. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that depends really upon who, who wins the Senate. And uh, if the Republicans continue controlling the Senate and the Democrats continue to control the House, we can see the same kind of legislative stalemate that we've seen, especially in the last two years, where one is swinging uh, radically to the left and the other one is continuing to be radically to the right, and nothing's happening in the middle. The other thing I would just sort of emphasize here about the election uh, is the, the fate of moderate Republicans and Democrats. And the, way, the reason I say it that way is that since Ronald Reagan, um, the moderate uh, core or the moderate group and the Republican Party has all but disappeared, uh, leaving the party really in the hands of extremes. And this is important because, uh, you know, the moderates were kind of a break on the Republican Party when it swung too far in either direction, either too far to the left or too far to the right. Um, you'll recall that when uh, Ronald Reagan, quite reluctantly, it turns out, ran in his first term, uh, in the 1980 elections, he reluctantly selected George Bush. And I say reluctantly because he Bush was not his first choice. His first choice was actually Gerald Ford. But Ford had been uh, the interim president after Nixon resigned on August 9th of 1974. And he didn't want to uh, be second fiddle on a Reagan ticket. But you'll, you'll remember that Bush was really a moderate Republican at the time that... Uh, you know, he served in the House, and at the time he was the CIA director and ambassador to China and so on. And he had to swing to the right to be on the Reagan ticket. And so uh, when Reagan ran again uh, in 1984, and then uh, the, he, he dominated the platform of the Republican Party. So it was now far right, uh, supply side economics, you'll recall. Uh, strong on defense, strong on law and order. So when Bush runs, uh, you know, in uh, 1990, he really is 
he's really running on a Reagan platform. Uh, he had to sort of uh, surrender his uh, moderate side in order to stay in a, in a leadership position in the party. Um, Romney was in a similar situation. When Romney was the governor of Massachusetts, he really was a moderate Republican. And uh, he really put in place in, in Massachusetts a version of Obamacare at the state level that the Obama people unabashedly you know, uh, adopted at the national level. Uh, and by the way, just a little footnote about Obamacare, that's really a misnomer because what Obama really wanted in his health care bill is not eventually what was passed on May 30th of, uh, of uh, 2010, because the Republicans, Republican-controlled Congress, would not allow a public option. And that's how we got the health care uh, insurance exchanges. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say here is that one of the things we, we want to see is that for both parties, not just the Republicans, uh, but starting with the Republicans, we need to see the revival of the moderate group in the Republican Party, because I think uh, without them, uh, you they were susceptible to a Trump type takeover. Okay. And uh, uh, the only voices that we heard were people like Romney, who warned us for an hour and a half about Trump before he was even nominated, right? Uh, and then, of course, we hear from Murkowski of Alaska. We hear from Collins from Maine. But, you know, they, 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 they sometimes vote as much with Trump as against Trump. So, you know, I mentioned that because that's, a, that's very important for our democracy, that no party really becomes an extremist party. When we have an extremist party, we're in danger. Uh, this happened back, you know, when George Wallace formed the American Independent Party, you know, we got nine million votes, right? Uh, this was an extremist party. And, uh, you know, we were really up against the wall. Thank goodness the countervailing reality was, uh, you know, people like Eugene McCarthy back then, who uh, kind of ran a, as a third force, and John Anderson, the Republican who ran as a moderate third force. But since the days of uh, Charles Mathias and Charles Percy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, the moderates in the Republican Party have really lost ground. So what we're really interested in seeing uh, in the 2020 election is whether we see some moderate Republicans elected or reelected. Uh, and if we don't see that, whether we see some Democrats, uh, even some of those who are sort of in the center of the Democratic Party elected, because uh, if we don't, we're going to be a bi bipolar um, sort of political uh, reality. And it's, and it's the same danger we'll have when people have bi bipolar disorders. You know, they, uh, they're they manic on the one side and depressive on the other, you know. So, so, you know, we have that. So I just wanted to throw those things out. Now, also, uh, we have to keep in mind that for all of the problems that we've had with COVID and the census, this is a census year. And the other thing that uh, we'll be looking forward to is how the eventual census results will uh, alter the electoral map. Uh, this is important because right now, you know, California has 55 electoral votes, Texas has 38, uh, New York and Florida are tied at 29. This all could shift as a result of reapportionment. Uh, following the 2020 census. Uh, and of course, the other thing we'll be looking to see, there are th two other sub trends uh, to look at that have electoral and public policy significance. One is we expect the non-white population uh, of citizens uh, to be even larger than it is now. So we expect somewhere between <clears throat> 53 and 57 million Hispanics uh, in a population, it'll be about 344 million. Uh, we expect nearly 50 million African Americans, a big upswing in the number of Asian Americans, both in the number of countries they come from and their absolute numbers. Uh, and when we put all that together uh, with the fact that they're concentrating in certain states, that can change uh, electoral dynamics very, very significantly. So we'll look for that. 
And then uh, the other thing we're looking at, folks, are is the old central city suburban divides. Uh, because right now, of course, in the state of Virginia, uh, our biggest uh, jurisdiction in terms of population at the county level is Fairfax County with over a million people. And our biggest uh, municipality is Virginia Beach, uh, a little over 400,000. And uh, it's not just the size of those jurisdictions that's important, it's the size of the metropolis around them. Because one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, when it comes to issues of race and immigration, that uh, where people live, whether they're in a core city or a suburb, makes a difference. Uh, suburbs and cities still do not cooperate with each other very well, uh, even when they have mutual interests in mind. Uh, so when I look at Northern Virginia, for example, uh, I look at the District of Columbia, whose population will increase uh, thanks to gentrification, and whose population, ironically and somewhat paradoxically, will become uh, majority white again, right? Because African Americans can't afford to live there, kind of like where I grew up in San Francisco. I don't think even rich people can afford to live in San Francisco, you know. Uh, so where are they going? They're, well, they're leaving for uh, more moderate, uh, you know, cost of living jurisdictions that are near where they used to live. In the case of Washington, D.C., it's Prince George's County and a little bit of Arlington County, but mostly Prince George's County. Uh, but immigrants, interestingly enough, are uh, popping up in significant numbers naturalized in the suburbs. So many of you know who uh, hang out in Northern Virginia, all you got to do is drive along Columbia Pike or um, Wilson Boulevard and you drive through Little Saigon, you drive through Little Addis Ababa, you know, these are the concentrations of non-white people who are usually second generation immigrants who are naturalized, who will be voting, some of whom will be voting for the first time in this election. This is going to be interesting, you know, and we haven't talked a lot about the immigrant vote uh, or the former immigrant vote or the newly naturalized American citizen vote. But that's important because those numbers are going to increase. The other thing about the census to keep in mind is that uh, usually after a census, we, re we redraw not only the political maps for reapportionment and redistricting, but we redraw the uh, statistical maps. So it's likely that Hampton Roads may add some jurisdictions to its existing group of uh, cities and counties. And like DC, the DC area has, you know, and, uh, before 1990, West Virginia and Harper's Ferry were not part of the DC metropolitan area. Now the Office of Management and Budget makes them part of the DC metropolitan statistical area. Why is that important? It's important because it's OMB and they determine what monies get into uh, jurisdictions that uh, are involved projects that go beyond one city or a town. So if you're building a new uh, silver line, for example, or you're building a new infrastructure, new highway, you're putting in easy passes, uh, you're building a new bridge or a trestle, building a new tunnel, uh, these, these statistical designations become important. So I want us to keep in mind uh, that we're going to track, or we try to keep abreast of what's going on with the census. At the local level, we're in James City County in Williamsburg, near York County, near um, New Kent County, and then of course you've got Norfolk and Virginia Beach. The other thing about the census numbers as well as the elections is their impact on something that we hardly talk about when we talk about politics, and yet it's fundamental. And that's the comprehensive plans of each jurisdiction. Th this is, this is the plan that is usually legislated, you know, by law at the local level, and it determines uh, things like land use and zoning. And if we're talking about making ourselves a more racially inclusive community, it begins with housing and neighborhoods. And um, if you've got a comprehensive plan that designates an area as residential, uh, but doesn't allow for significant densities of housing, by almost by fiat, it excludes certain 
uh, demographic groups that have larger than average families, for example. You know. So all of these things are interconnected to both the electoral process and the public policy process. So I, I'm sorry to go on for so long there, but I just wanted to get those few little points in and then stop at this moment uh, and we can fight about whatever you want to fight about. <laughs> we have some questions. Jody's kind of been collecting some. Good. We have some some questions for All you. All right, good. Yes. Um, so we, we have a couple of questions related to the issue of um, being centrist. Uh, so what does it mean? What is a moderate Republican? And also what does it mean for either a candidate or an individual citizen to identify as neither left nor right, but as independent or somehow in the center? Well, a couple of things there. One, uh, moderate Republicans uh, usually uh, are more amenable to bipartisan solutions to public policies. Uh, they are not as uh, restrained about the role of government as the more extreme wing of the party is. Uh, they are more fiscally progressive. They, they don't mind uh, uh, spending money uh, through the federal government in order to stabilize an industry or in order to support a group that needs ac economic support. So that distinguishes them from the further right portions of the of the party. They're not as uh, religiously conservative as the uh, as the right wing of the party. And that that's a little problematic because, you know, Catholic conservatism and Baptist conservatism and Pentecostal conservatism, are not all the same thing, you know. And so I always ask myself, uh, having been raised in the Catholic Church, and not sure whether that's R-A-I-S-E-D or R-A-Z-E-D. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, what would Jesus think about all of this? You know, I mean, you know, yeah, when he was around, he was a little leery of zealots, you know. Uh, this is why he couldn't side with Barabbas, you know, because Barabbas was a zealot, right? But anyway, uh, and I, I see it in the chat, a question about religious nationalists. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the way that the, the uh, religious nationalists or extremists, I would call them, uh, can be curtailed is from within the church institution itself. Um, I, I think that the, the, the conservatives that we're talking about, the evangelicals, as they're called, really sort of represent a largely white um, uh, Pentecostal orientation with some Baptists and Methodists and others thrown in. You get a, a handful of Episcopalians, a handful of Presbyterians, no Quakers, um, uh, a handful of Catholics. Uh, so I think the, the institutions themselves check how they are aligned themselves with the electoral process. Uh, you know, this was a uh, a thing that Ronald Reagan, you know, was really high on. He he wasn't really that much of a religious man himself, you know, uh, but he was a good actor. You know, well, he was a pretty good actor. And uh, he made himself look like he was, you know, for these Christian values and so on and so forth. Uh, all except outreach to the poor, which is a fundamental Christian value, you know, uh, looking out for the most vulnerable, uh, taking care of and addressing the needs of those who are hungry, sick, without clothes, in jail, you know, things that Christ said himself, right? Well, uh, so I think we, we heard just this week, the Tidewater, uh, I believe, I, I think they're the Tidewater uh, Baptist Convention and chose not to formally endorse any candidate, uh, but they criticized President Trump for uh, any number of things that he's done and not done, but also for his sort of distortion of what uh, Christian values are all about, you know. And uh, so I think the reform has to come from the inside. I was quite frankly heartened to hear that Pope Francis uh, this week had, had said, look, you know, he was uh, supporting civil unions uh, in, in the gay community. That's a huge development in the Catholic Church, I can tell you. I mean, because, uh, you know, the, you talk about conservatism on these matters. The, the Catholic Church is just not moved very much on things like, uh, you know, gay marriage, uh, gay unions, uh, on divorce, on, uh, you know, the excommunication of people who are divorced who want to 
who want to remarry again. They just haven't moved very much on it. So for Pope Francis to come out and say things like, it's not for me to judge uh, when it comes to uh, gay and transgender people. Wow, that's, that's huge, you know. So my point simply is uh, that this has to come from inside those uh, denominations themselves. Now, uh, I think about the Quakers a great deal because uh, even before we formed as a nation, and uh, be, even before the American Revolutionary period, the Quakers were progressive on issues like abolishing slavery, uh, you know, getting support to people who were needy. Uh, they were not only abolitionists, but after the war, uh, they created schools, kind of like the Rosenwald schools to educate freedmen. Uh, uh, they are and pacifists. Uh, so they're on the other side of this, you know, and they sort of exemplify what a religious uh, institution could do. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I kind of extol where, they, where, where they're coming from here. Um, so, you know, someone asked, uh, it depends upon who put Biden puts around him. Uh, I like to see him put several kinds of people around him. First of all, I think that he won't have to be lectured or urged to put in the leadership position of these agencies qualified folks who represent uh, all kinds of backgrounds. I think, I think people like uh, Susan Rice likely to end up as Secretary of State. Uh, I don't think that Biden will insult uh, someone like Ben Carson, you know, this distinguished surgeon who pioneered in, uh, you know, uh, surgery on Siamese twins. What does he do? He makes him the head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, not of Health and Human Services. Uh, I don't think Biden will make a mistake like that. You know, I think he's going to put someone in there at the leadership level who really has the background and the understanding. Uh, you know, I think it will be a very diversified cabinet. I really do. I have a feeling that whoever is in charge um, in the Department of Justice, the new Attorney General, is probably going to be a woman or a person of color. It would not surprise me. And they're going to take that department back where it should be uh, when it comes to its statutory and constitutional responsibility. Uh, I think his Council of Economic Advisors, uh, his staff uh, that he will call together to advise him on the coronavirus and, and vaccines, uh, his FDA appointee, his CDC appointees uh, will be much more responsive uh, and much more forthcoming because they'll know that the president will be listening to them and not trying to manipulate them. So uh, that's what I mean by who, who, who he puts around them. Uh, I hope he doesn't take any progressive Democrats <laughs> out of the Congress to put in the cabinet, which is the habit of certain presidents. You know, take uh, really stellar members of the Congress and they'll put them in the cabinet, which sort of deprives the Congress that good person just at the time we need them, you know. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, uh, Biden, uh, this is just uh, just an opinion. I'm, please take it just as that. I, I think I think Biden is going to be a one-term president. And I think he, uh, some of his energy uh, in the first several years will be laying the ground for his successor. And this is going to be important because I think whoever he – puts in these administrative posts and these advisory posts and these chief of staff posts and so on is going to have a role in building the bridge uh, to the next uh, Democratic Party leader. Uh, because uh, I just don't think his his health and his, uh, you know, his, um, I could be wrong, but I, I, I just don't think he'll be there for a second term. So um, I think it will be a real compliment in some ways to the American people that they say, well, yeah, we know he's 77, but we want him anyway. Uh, because they could very well say, oh, no, nah, he's too old. Plus that hair transplant, you know, just doesn't get it, you know, look like bad agriculture. Now here we got two white guys running for president, both with hair issues, you know, uh, Biden with that awful hair transplant that looks like bad agriculture. And, uh, Trump with a hairpiece that's obviously a hairpiece. And uh, if you have a hairpiece like that and you're snuggling up close to the National Rifle Association, 
you don't want anybody who shoots like Dick Cheney around you, you know, that kind of thing, you know. But, uh, but also, uh, uh, I don't, I'll be really surprised, I, I'm being really blunt about this, if uh, there's any movement toward abolishing the Electoral College. Um, we say this at the end of every election. I mean, even when it's not so close, we say we got to get rid of the, the Electoral College and just go with the popular vote. I'll be really surprised if it happens. There seems to be an inertia around that. Uh, so I, I wouldn't expect a lot to do uh, happen there. I think it's more likely that there'll be some action about the Supreme Court than the Electoral College. Uh, and uh, the fact that they were fairly mum, Biden and Harris on the question about stacking the courts, I think telegraphs the possibility that there might be a proposal to uh, increase the number of seats on the Supreme Court, uh, especially now that the um, nomination of Amy Coney Barrett is almost certain. Uh, but on the other side of it, you know, if I were Joe Biden, you know, I would also recognize that members of the Supreme Court uh, cannot be absolutely predicted as to their position on cases. And that's that's true because, number one, um, they have to deal with not only precedent, but they have to deal with the way the cases are presented to them. Uh, the way they come up through the federal district court, the court of appeals, the way they're argued by the various sides uh, makes a lot of difference in the way that they'll be judged. So I would say that anybody who's concerned about Roe versus Wade, Obamacare, uh, restoring the voting rights provision that was weakened, uh, getting rid of Citizens United, any of those kinds of things, make the advocates and the attorneys develop stronger and more compelling cases before the court than they did the last time because that's what the justices really have to respond to. And looking back over uh, the last uh, you know, 30 years of the court's actions, we've been surprised that uh, people like Sandra Day O'Connor, who was appointed by a conservative president, ended up being a key moderate force on the court. Uh, you know, and uh, the only non-surprise was Clarence Thomas. We just knew he wasn't gonna do anything that really was significant. And, you know, personally to me, his appointment was a major insult to Thurgood Marshall. It really was, among other things, you know. Uh, but but other, than, other than that, look already, Neil Gorsuch sur has surprised everybody by voting with uh, Chief Justice Roberts on the, on the discrimination case against transgender people, uh, expanding the application of the Civil Rights Act or, and Title IX. Uh, and uh, the Chief Justice himself has been a surprise because he's, he's appointed by a right of center Republican. So, you know, you can't predict exactly what these folks are going to do. Uh, and so uh, there's an argument for not messing with the courts here and just making sure that when you get these uh, cases into the federal district court and the Court of Appeals that you're as strong as possible on your side of whatever the case is. Now, the other side of this, of course, is that Trump has been successful in getting confirmed a very significant number of justices at the federal district court level and court of appeals level who are quite conservative. So they may cut off uh, a number of cases uh, before they even reach the Supreme Court uh, that in uh, a different configuration would have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. So we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know there. Um, I also um, uh, believe, I'm, I'm just looking at the chat here, but I think that uh, <laughs> somebody asked about the hair charts. Well, you can see in my condition, I'm a very close observer of men's hairs you know, or lack of, you know, uh, and believe it or not, I used to have an Afro, you know, now I have an after fro, you know, uh, fro no mo, you know, we're froless. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we can just survive as a democracy. Uh, and the reason I feel so optimistic about it is that it's the things that don't get a lot of press attention constantly that you have to pay attention to. Just like it's the things that are less visible in our reality that end up having the most consequence, like a virus. 
You know, we can't see that as much as an outbreak of uh, civil disturbance in uh, in a city, but it's just as lethal, <laughs> probably more lethal. And so one of the things that's going on across the country, uh, you know, I'm learning from my friends across the United States is that folks are coming together in ways we haven't seen them come together in spite of all of this reputation and and talk we have of divisiveness and, you know, uh, all of that. I've seen a lot of bridges being built, a lot of hands being extended, a lot of support being given uh, that doesn't get the press attention uh, that some of the other things get. Thank goodness. Maybe maybe when it gets the press attention, it'll, it, it will go a different way. But I, I really rest my case on that. And I think we have a chance really to re-stimulate our um, focus on what democracy actually means here. Uh, you know, as we practice it, as we try to practice it. So, you know, it's kind of like uh, in a marriage, you know, uh, you know, uh, no amount of training really can prepare you. I mean, you can have good upbringing and, and so on and so forth and still blow it in the marriage, right? Uh, but you got to work at it. You have to constantly work at it. You've got to be prepared for the rough times, for better or for worse. Uh, you've got to, on occasion, extend amnesty to each other and to both of us. Of, of the parties in the marriage, you know, and my wife reminds me that when I act up, you know, she gently reminds me that the beds in the homeless shelter are too small for me, you know, and things like that. Uh, but we constantly work at it. And it's very frequently our mistakes that are just as instructive in the long run as our successes. Uh, when my sons uh, were little guys, they said, Dad, when when we grow up, we want to be just like you. And I said, that's wonderful, son, but I hope not. That's not your job. It's not your job to be like me. It's your job to be something I can't even imagine right now. In the same way, I've become something that my mother and father would have never imagined me in particular becoming, you know, or me in general becoming. Uh so our next chapters, our next iterations of what democracy is and what it means may not look anything like uh, the way we started, you know. But the key is that we work on it together, uh, that we engineer it together, we define it together, because whatever it is and whatever we call it, uh, we'll all have to dine on it. And in the end, we will either uh, be nourished by it or we will die by it, you know. But it has to be ours, you know. And so I don't feel as pessimistic as some people be, feel about uh, uh, democracy. Maybe I'm more naive, you know. I live um, in a very rural part of uh, Surrey County, um, and all of my neighbors are white. Uh, we're the only black family in this neck of the woods, literally. And when we first got here, we were a little concerned about that, you know. In, in rural Virginia, right in the midst of uh, white folks we don't know well, and and a, a bunch of uh, Trump and Pence signs all around us, you know, and all. But as I've gotten to know my neighbors and, and just sit down and talk to them, uh, not necessarily about politics, you know, a lot of those fears and so on have dissipated. They really have. We don't agree on everything. We don't. We don't expect to agree on everything. But that's where it starts. And uh, I think the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, said something uh, very profound about American politics. He said, fundamentally, all politics is local. So whatever you do at the local level uh, really sort of starts the show. And it ends the show, too. Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of things happening at the grassroots level across the country. Those elected officials uh, who are serving in cities and counties and townships and, and villages, uh, they count. And uh, the way they translate what's going on at the state level and then with the federal level makes all the difference in the way we actually see, feel, and experience public policy. You know, uh, on the other side of it, the electoral process starts from the local level, doesn't it? I mean, county registrars of voters, election judges, uh, you know, the people have to, the, the candidates have to get a certain number of delegates at the state level, which means they have to, you know, get them at the local levels first. Uh, I'm glad we're constructed that way rather than having a national 
Politburo or something, select the candidates who are going to run at the at the local levels and at the uh, uh, municipal levels. So I'm hoping that one of the things we're going to do is we're talking about what's going to happen to Roe versus Wade and what's going to happen to Obamacare. What I want to know is what's going to happen to uh, the uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission case of 10 years ago. What's going to happen to the, uh, you know, the Shelby versus Hull case, which eviscerated an important part of the Voting Rights Act. That's what I want to know uh, on the part of the courts. And we, we can't wait for the, the justices. We have to bring the cases to the justices because of the way our court system works, uh, the switch doesn't get turned on until a citizen files a complaint, files a grievance, uh, and starts the process. And Doc I'd much rather see us focus on that than some of the things that we've talked about in the, in the other realm. I'm sorry. Dr. Henderson, we've had some questions come in privately uh, to me. So actually just to the point that, uh, that you were making about sort of participation in democracy, um, you know, one of the one of the questions is about people. There are a number of people, both in this election and I would also say in, in 2016, who saw the the choice of the candidates as being about the lesser of two evils. They really didn't like either candidate, and so they were voting more in opposition rather than in favor. And you, uh, whether or not it's true that the you know, candidates are actually safe or evil or whatnot, um, what what does that perception do to the willingness, especially of younger voters who are very disillusioned with the process? What does that mean for us as far as increasing participation in democracy? Yeah, I think it, uh, you know, quite honestly, I think it, it, it raises some doubts in their minds about how viable democracy is. But we've seen this before. This is not the first time this has happened. Uh, I saw a, a groundswell of enthusiasm around uh, less conventional candidates like Eugene McCarthy, like uh, George McGovern and so on. And when they didn't do as well as their supporters thought uh, they should do, uh, they felt that the country had been literally sold to the devil. And we're getting a bit of that now. You know, the, the Bernie Sanders supporters who feel that, uh, you know, Biden's nomination really is a betrayal of uh, the, gra the ground roots, a uh, grassroots settlement that uh, got uh, Sanders so much support in 2016 and uh, in 2019, uh, they feel somewhat betrayed by Biden, you know. But at the same time, those same voters, those same activists uh, are a large part of the reason that we got the blue wave in 2018. So I want them to continue to be engaged at the level that they are until we can make the big change at the national level uh, and not to drop out and say, look, you know, lesser of two evils. If we've got the lesser of two evils, it's us who put those two evils in candidacy, you know. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope they don't drop out because uh, uh, we're going to need them not only to vote in this election, but to be the core of what the next iterations of our electoral process is going to be. So I hope they'll stay with it. But I, I hear what they're saying. I definitely hear what they're saying. And uh, I also think that the coalitions are likely to be re redrawn uh, after this election. They really are. Uh, I really think, as I said before, I, I, privately, I think that Joe Biden is going to be one one term guy. And now the question is, who's going to be the successor? Uh, and it doesn't automatically fall to Kamala Harris. So it's quite possible that, uh, uh, you know, since uh, Sanders is up at an age two, he may actually uh, bless or designate some a successor to him that these folks can rally around. It might be, you know, uh, you know uh, Octavio Ocasio Cortez, or it might be uh, Ayanna Presley. You know, it could be. Karen Bass. I mean, we, we, you know, there are a number of folks that, that are out there. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Um, you know, I, I don't think of Elizabeth Warren as a 70 year old for some reason. I think of her, you know, like, uh, 
you know, that movie, My Cousin Vinny, she's one of the two youths, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I would say to that group, don't be disillusioned. Don't drop out yet. There's still work to do. Uh, you have made some impression and some impact on the process so far. It's not as, as much as you'd like to make at this point, but I think the chapters are still being written. So keep writing. Thank you. Um, a number of people have uh, raised questions about Biden's history with the black community. And of course, Kamala Harris's history as a prosecutor and what that has done to the black community in California. So what do you think of um, allegations made against them and about Biden's ability to meet the needs of the black community? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out, first of all, that Biden coming from Delaware biggest city in Delaware is Wilmington uh, with about a 40% African-American population. And he's got, he's had to relate to the African-American population to win his Senate, Senate seat. Uh, uh, and he does have a history and his family has a history of working progressively on race relations. Now I wasn't too happy to be honest with where he came out on the Hill and Thomas hearings way back there in 1991, you know, uh, I think uh, he was trying to accommodate his more conservative, mostly Southern white folks uh, who were backing Thomas. Now, I never thought I'd see this in my life. White segregationists supporting a black man with a white wife to be on the Supreme Court. But I wasn't too happy with that. I wasn't too happy with his posture on the uh, crime bill of the 1990s because he and Clinton uh, I think sold on that one. Uh, but uh, I think in the main, on the larger uh, level, he has been very progressive on the issue of race relations. And let us not forget that in this primary, what turned the corner for him was the support of African Americans, especially in South Carolina, led by Jim Cl uh, Clyburn. Okay. And Biden hasn't forgotten that. I mean, uh, he, he knows that. He's very well aware. And I think he's also, uh, you know, learned something from his exchanges with Kamala Harris or, uh, when she was running for the presidency and she confronted him directly. Now on Kamala, I remember Kamala Harris when I was teaching at Howard University. I remember her as an undergraduate student as being uh, very ambitious, very bright, very sharp, uh, dynamic, uh, you know, absolutely stunningly beautiful uh, and so on and so forth. I remember that like it was, yesterday. And having grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area, she was actually born in Oakland, uh, but moved to San Francisco. And nobody expected her to beat the incumbent district attorney in San Francisco. This guy was like an institution. And she's very, very good. She's very clever. And she's up on the issues. And she said, look, uh, what you have to understand here is that, you know, it's not too often that people of color are in the prosecutorial position. They're usually, you know, uh, having to get a public defender, right? Uh, I wanted to run because I thought I could make a difference uh, in the way and how people were convicted. I can be fair. And she actually did institute some significant reforms in San Francisco when it came to decriminalizing certain kinds of things, police surveillance. She prosecuted two or three pretty high profile police brutality cases, which she doesn't get a lot of credit for. Uh, so she was uh, actually uh, uh, much more progressive than she's characterized. Now, I think when she became attorney general of California, now you're dealing with a bigger uh, fish pond here with more conservative elements in it. And I think she did some things, quite frankly, in the attorney general's position. I, you know, I, I had some issues with, but in the main, she was a, a reform attorney general. Uh, and particularly on immigration issues, which he, of course, would be sensitive to with a father who was from Jamaica and a mother who was from India. Um, so I think in a way her prosecutorial background might actually be an advantage here because uh, she, she knows how to make a case and she knows how to challenge folks. And I think in order to make public policy, even as a vice president, uh, you're going to have to challenge a few people. You're going to have to rub a few people the wrong way. Uh, you're going to have to make a case, uh, collect the evidence, you know, deal with the data. And I think she's able to do that. So while I have some misgivings about some of the things that she's done, 
I think in the main, she was the right choice for Biden. Uh, and I think she'll be an effective uh, vice president if elected. Um, we have another question related to the US census. Um, and the Census Bureau this year uh, implemented a new policy of differential privacy, which changes uh, the nature of the data that uh, sub entities, the states will get back from the census once it's completed. Do you have any thoughts about what the likely impact of that will be on funding allocations at the lower levels? Yeah, I got big, big problems with that one because I think it will uh, adversely affect funding allocations. So uh, and can that you explain one, what it is a little bit more too what, for people? Who yeah, I, well, I think part, part of the deal here is what kind of data uh, the Census Bureau can collect in the first place and what and who it can distribute it to uh, and under what circumstances and uh, with what discretion. That, that's the issue here. And I think since census uh, has been conducted since 1790, it's always been thought of as something that would be at the information level totally in the public domain. That is to say, whatever we collect, uh, any American should know uh, in collective terms what it says. Uh, I think a lot of the privacy issues here have to do with uh, any chance of isolating or identifying people by individual uh, identity or household identity, that kind of thing, uh, that we have to protect against. But the rest of the data should be available to any jurisdiction uh, or to any public user uh, that is mandated to serve the public. Uh, so that's all, uh, all 50 states, all 91,000 local governments, uh, federal agencies, et cetera, should have these data. Uh, there is no uh, suggestion that the data is going to be used in some way for criminal purposes, you know, because uh, this is a civil operation. So I think the concern was that the data might fall in the hands of, uh, of uh, law enforcement and criminal justice agencies who might uh, inappropriately use it. Kind of like the concern we had after 911 uh, with the passage of the first and second Patriot Acts and the concern that we were compromising civil liberties, looking for terrorists, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, I think the issue here is that uh, the Census Bureau cannot really uh, say to uh, any jurisdiction that has a public mandate, we're, we're going to give you this data, but we're not going to give you this data. You know, I think all of the data that they need should be made available to them. And that, that, that's, that's important because they have decisions they have to make based upon uh, the best census and evidence that they can collect and, and, uh, and examine. So I have a little problem when the Census Bureau does that. But remember that the Census Bureau is in the Commerce Department, right? And the Commerce Department is headed currently by a secretary who's a Trump appointee. And what you hear talking is the shadow of, of Trump's view of what the census should and shouldn't be. You remember he wanted that citizenship question thrown in there, primarily to deal with the immigration issue. Okay. Uh, well, these were just ways of sort of subverting the purpose of the census, uh, which really is to serve the public. It's not really to isolate your political enemies, you know, and uh, so, uh, I think uh, I think what we're going to see if Biden is elected, uh, we'll probably get uh, a change in that orientation. We're going to get a change in, in the leadership of the Census Bureau. And with that will come a change in that orientation. And by the way, this is not only happening with the census, but the other way that Virginians are affected right now is that the head of the National uh, Endowment for the Humanities is trying to hold back money to be allocated to the Virginia Humanities because they didn't like an article that one member of the board wrote, uh, an op-ed piece, giving her own personal opinion. They didn't like what she said, so they want to hold back the money. Uh, so I told <laughs> I'm on the board there, so I said, look, don't get in that fight right now, because uh, the election is going to press put the mute button on this guy anyway, and uh, you're going to get a change in the leadership there. So whatever the census folks are saying right now, uh, you know, I would just sort of hold it until after the election because those folks may not be around thereafter. Thanks. 
Um, we have a question about uh, the money and uh, conflict of interests and how can voters reconcile the amount of money that the, both the tr Trump and the Biden families have and the uh, perception that that creates of conflict of interest or the reality of conflict of interests with what the American people want? Thank you for that question. It's a very good question. I think uh, we are in a backwater when it comes to money and politics uh, that we really have to extricate ourselves from that, uh, you know, goes all the way back to, again, Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission. And what happens here, of course, is that uh, um, after Watergate in 1974, Congress passes the Federal Elections Reform Act, which puts in place things like the requirement if you're running for president or vice president to disclose all of the sources of your personal income and to disclose all of the sources of your campaign income on the public record to be uh, managed by and made available through the Federal Elections Commission. This was in the name of transparency, right? And uh, uh, what essentially happens with Citizens United is because uh, a candidate threatened to, uh, a, a, to write a story uh, about a candidate here, uh, this case goes to court on a First Amendment basis, and it takes the caps off of the amount of money that can be contributed to a political action committee or an institution supporting, not the candidate directly, but an institution supporting the candidate, completely takes the caps off. So this enabled Donald Trump, for example, to literally buy the Republican primary in 2016. He needed some more money from the Republican National Committee going into the general election, but he, he essentially bought the primary. So for him to complain that, uh, you know, somehow his opponents are buying elections and so on is a little duplicitous, you know. But on the other side of it, uh, Biden is ironically uh, outracing pump, uh, Trump in campaign uh, contributions in some places by a two to one margin. And I think that's very dangerous. I mean, it's a very dangerous thing when uh, you, you do this, especially when a lot of the money is not coming from the Bernie Sanders sort of 20, 25, $27 uh, a person contribution, but it's coming from large uh, institutions that have um, sort of institutional stakes in the elections. Not, not just corporations, but corporate trade organizations. That's different, you know. Uh, not just individuals with a lot of money, but individuals whose institutions have a lot of money. So Warren Buffett's putting his stuff in through his, you know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway institution. Uh, we're seeing the farmers and the, you know, the, Amer the uh, National uh, Manufacturing Association and the Chamber of Commerce put in record amount of money behind these candidates. And I think that's really a very dangerous thing that speaking about dangers to democracy, when contributions to political campaigns get beyond the average uh, contribution a household would make, we're really in the danger zone here of, of literally uh, selling our elections uh, to the highest bidder. And uh, that I think is gonna have to be addressed going forward, hopefully by the Congress, if not by the courts. Uh, this question relates to what you said earlier regarding the census um, and the uh, you know waiting for the election and possibly having the agency will change its policy on that. Um, there was an article recently about how uh, a lot of the federal agencies are scrambling right now to cement uh, regulations and rules that will establish Trump's legacy uh, before the election or before he's out of office. So how? easy or difficult is it for these federal agencies to change rules or uh, regulations that their predecessors have put in place? That's a good one. Uh, I'm glad you raised that because a lot of people don't realize that once you enact a piece of legislation, uh, the, the legislation does three things. It establishes the purpose or direction of the legislation. Um, it designates an administrative agency to carry it out and it appropriates money for that agency to, to do its work. Uh, 
the strange thing about Trump is, and, and the Congress that served uh, during the Trump presidency, is that they haven't produced that much legislation. Uh, and therefore, they haven't created many new administrative agencies who can then write rules and regulations uh, there. So they've had to rely on the existing agencies to shift the rules and regulations that they've written. I think what's going to happen here is that, yes, they're going to try to load these up before they leave office. But remember that these rules and regulations have to be vetted uh, by the public. You know, they, you, you have to publish them in the Federal Register. You've got uh, 30 to 120 days to comment on them, et cetera. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a rush of interest groups and individuals coming in uh, if, if Biden gets elected. Uh, trying to either support uh, or uh, to eliminate the new rules that Trump tried to put through before he got out. I think that's what's going to happen there. I think the regulatory postures of key big regulatory agencies like the EPA and the Federal uh, Drug, Food and Drug Administration, Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission, with new appointees to those commissions, those rules and regulations that Trump put in place are likely to be reversed uh, in the same way that Trump tried to reverse those that came about during the Obama administration. So I think he may try to stack all of these rules in his direction to create a legacy. And it may take a while to unravel this and to unwind what he's doing. But I don't think it's going to get very far, number one, because he didn't lay uh, with the Congress too much of a legislative uh, foundation for these regulations. And two, because a lot of the regulatory uh, actions that he's taken really have come through the appointment of his people in these regulatory agencies. Uh, and I think the uh, Biden and Harris uh, campaign will, will change that entire leadership structure. And they're going to go about trying to change those rules back. You know, like, for example, uh, the net neutrality rules in the Federal Communications Commission. You know, you're going to get a new chair of the Federal Communications Commission, and that's probably going to change those rules back to uh, a posture they were approximately before. Uh, I think we're going to see the restoration, if Biden and Harris get elected, of a lot of EPA rules that have been relaxed or eliminated, especially those that have to do with maximum uh, daily loadings of pollution in, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, things that have to do with air quality, soil quality, water quality. Um, I think, you know, uh, Biden and Harris will probably rejoin the Paris Accords, uh, which will, uh, you know, cap, uh, will attempt to cap uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, you know, do something different with uh, carbon credits than the Trump administration uh, was trying to do. So uh, I don't think we're going to go back to, we, and Trump wasn't successful really in taking us back to a fossil fuel regime, for example, uh, simply because so much had changed in the other direction that he wasn't able to reverse it. And we had uh, slowed down industry production in those areas a great deal. Um, so whether he likes it or not, uh, I don't think that uh, coal is going to be uh, and natural gas are going to be the same centerpiece of his energy program uh, as we'll see with Biden and Harris. Uh, one thing that may go forward uh, with Biden and Harris, they'll have to do it carefully, of course, is fracking. You know, because that's made the U.S. again the top natural gas producer in the world, you know. Uh, so it's not going to be easy to reverse that. But, but coal, I think, uh, you know, is not going to come back. I think there'll be some reconsideration of nuclear power. We have two nuclear power plants in our region, and one in Surrey and one in North Anna. And uh, I think there'll be some talk about what to do with not just nuclear power at the commercial level, but with those depositories, you know, where the fuel is supposed to be deposited once it's used. We still don't have a permanent uh, repository. Uh, the last one we had is out in the Yucca Mountains in Nevada, and uh, it's still not permanent. And uh, now we are uh, disposing of the nuclear waste of other countries. It, Italy has been shipping nuclear waste over to us because they don't have a repository. And we're putting it out there in Clive, Utah, 
you know. So all of this, I think, is going to change uh, significantly uh, if Trump is not reelected. We have one last question in the chat. Um, last night, uh, Joe Biden closed the debate with a message about compassion and unity, um, which uh, for a lot of progressives, uh, that sounded very reasonable and very encouraging. Can you describe in your, in your opinion, what, what is it about Trump that appeals to voters who are supporting him? <laughs> well, <laughs> a nice well, easy question uh, to close out the night. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that's like me trying to second guess Beelzebub, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I think there are a number of things, uh, and this is just a, a perspective. Uh, first of all, I think his, uh, when he says make America great again, uh, the dog whistle there is really to make America white again, you know. And they see this non white uh, population surge coming, and they believe that this is going to be the end of their hegemony, uh, economically and politically, and they're resisting it as much as possible. And there are a lot of folks uh, who benefit from the, uh, the old white hegemony regime that we have, uh, who, who want Trump to stay there for that reason, as a, as a bulwark against that kind of movement. Um, also that he, uh, he talks tough in ways they like for him to talk tough when it comes to foreign leaders you know, he, he tells NATO, you either pay, pay your share or we're pulling out. Uh, he calls uh, Kim Jong-un little rocket man and, and goes over and right to his face, you know, confronts him about the rockets. Uh, you know, he says to, uh, to the Mexicans, you're, you're, you're a bunch of rapists and shouldn't be coming across the border. And even yesterday, he said the ones that are trying to get in are the ones with lower IQs. I mean, you know. These are the kinds of things in the minds of a lot of his supporters who they would dare not say too much in public unless they were at a uh, Nazi riot uh, uh, gathering of some kind or they were the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, he's saying things that they really are thinking, you know, so that that appeal. And then the, the group that I, I have the most trouble with, of course, are, is the Christian right, because I think everything I understand, which is weak about the Old and New Testament, uh, I don't think uh, this in any way resembles Christ's message. And yet uh, many of them think that because he's standing up uh, for right to life and, uh, you know, for these Christian values of, uh, you know, of, of, of doing the right thing and, and dealing with these heathen Muslims around the world and these terrorists and so on, uh, that they can back him, you know. But 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 that's a misreading, I think, of uh, of the of the the New Testament and certainly of the Old Testament. And uh, uh, but it also explains why why he's so appealing. And I have to say, no matter what you think about Trump, he is in his ignorance and in his adamancy, he is absolutely brash and bold. He will say anything at any time. Uh, that comes to his mind, whether you like it or not, and you know, and there are not a lot of politicians like that. I mean, you know, uh, and, uh, who will just come out and just say, "Look, this is the way it is," you know, and uh, he could be dead wrong, and you'll still say it anyway, you know. So, uh, and then he says some things that is absolutely ludicrous, like, for example, uh, when he was under uh, scrutiny for the Stormy Daniels situation there. Uh, he claimed that he couldn't have done it because uh, during the 2016 primaries, Mario Rubio said his hands were too small, you know, <laughs> things like this, you know. And uh, so so the man is absolutely brash. I mean, I can't think of a politician, even somebody as strong as Lyndon Johnson. As Johnson was a very strong politician, a very brazen politician in some ways, even George Wallace. Uh, who who is br as brazen and as brash as Trump has been. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible some of the things that he said, how he said them, and how he's repeated them. And uh, this appeals to a certain element, to the, 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 the sort of John Wayne, uh, you know, Western frontier mentality. We'll mow them down, you know, you know, pilgrim if we have to, you know. Uh, so I think those kinds of things appeal to his supporters a great deal. And uh, 
you know, uh, when he comes out and says something like, you know, the black community has never had a supporter like me since Abraham Lincoln. I mean, who, who would say that in their right mind? You know? uh, you know, but, but he actually, not even Biden would say that, you know, you know, that the, the black community is the, the, the best hope. Uh, I'm the best hope for the black community since Lincoln. He, he wouldn't say that, you know, but, but Trump says that, you know, he, 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 uh, he just absolutely no boundaries whatsoever. And uh, poor Melania, you know, she's really kind of in a hot spot here because, uh, you know, uh, she's got to be, you know, cringing every time he she hear him, hears him talk. And you remember she was accused of stealing Michelle Obama's lines at one point. And I thought uh, SNL did a wonderful <laughs> skit on that where, you know, she said, I've written this speech. It's all mine. Every word is original. I'm going to give it to you now. Listen very carefully. As a young black girl growing up on the south side of Chicago, <laughs> I thought, you know, so you know, so I think, folks, uh, the bottom line for us here, uh, we have been through uh, four years of a very, very unusual presidency. Uh, it should be uh, a bunch of teachable moments for us, and I hope that those teachable moments have been learned in a way that manifests themselves on November third and thereafter. Well, Dr. Henderson, I don't know. You, um, you, you always come out of this, Will. I always feel a little more hopeful, and that's really <laughs> hard to do. Is there anyone else in the room that, that are still here that, that have a question for Dr. Henderson? I, I'm not good at writing and listening, so if, if anyone has one that they'd like to ask. Anyone? No? All right. Well, I, I, was there is anything you'd like to add, Dr. Henderson, to, um, to this evening? Gratitude. Gratitude for all together uh, and for the quality of the people in this group, uh, the mighty souls and minds that make up that group, and the fact that you're continuing to do this work of uh, building and maintaining a critical part of the civic infrastructure that's indispensable to whatever view of the short and long-term future we have. Well, I thank you very much for that. I um, There's still some people left that are on our board. Y'all can wave your hands. Um, we really do appreciate you coming and spending another Friday with us. Um, and uh, for for the, the, the good of the evening here. Um, well, thank we you. Well, I'm, I'm, I knew this was going to be good. So I'm, and um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank everyone for, for spending the evening with us. Go get something to eat. Go get a snack, <laughs> glass of wine. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, last week I fixed uh, some, some croakers that we caught in the, and I, I discovered very quickly why they call them croakers because uh, I almost died from that meal, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, tell I, your I'm wife doing... happy birthday as well. And thank you. Happy and birthday. One of the benefits of COVID, because we are homebound, is that I get to uh, cook with her and for her more often. And, and she's a good customer. And being from New Orleans, uh, whenever I burn something, I say it's not burned; it's blackened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> blackened. That's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah. We really Thank appreciate you, Doctor. the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And take care of yourselves. Please, please be yeah, safe. And, and look out. We have we have another. Uh, we'll have in uh, in uh, where are we? November. What was it, Jody? Or is our next? We have another uh, coming together meeting um, that the coalition will be presenting what they're doing. Do you remember what date that is? I think it's the sixteenth, November sixteenth. The, November the 16th, coalition so for community justice. I should have put that on the on the list of things to say, but um, thanks for. Well, so we all want to thank Beth for her leadership and yes. for Jody for helping us technically here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, have a good evening. Thank Take you. care of yourselves now. I'll good be night. with you, Dr. Henderson. Okay, very good. Thank you. Now. Thank you.